If we think of the word antihistamine, or histamine blockers is really what, as we're going to see, that's really what they are. Uh, if an antihistamine is simply blocking or stopping the action of histamine. So we should first remember, remind ourselves, what's histamine? What's histamine? Because an antihistamine just stops histamine. So histamine is a chemical that is released by mast cells and basophil white blood cells. And there are many things that can cause uh, mast cells and basophil white blood cells to release histamine. Uh, it, uh, it can be released in response to an allergic reaction. So when people have a hypersensitivity or an allergy to something, whether it's a fur of an animal, a food, uh, a medicine, so it triggers mast cells, as we reviewed previously, uh, to release histamine. Um, and uh, uh, certain other things can release it, but that's, uh, we'll talk about an allergic reaction. Now, what does histamine do? First off, we've mentioned that histamine can actually activate two different types of receptors. There are actually what are known as H1, histamine type 1 receptors, and there's also histamine type 2 receptors. And our first thought is, well, what does that mean? Well, we have learned that acetylcholine can activate uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor sites on skeletal muscle cells and muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites on visceral organs and brain cells. We have learned that uh, epinephrine can activate both alpha adrenergic receptor sites and beta adrenergic receptor sites. So there are different types of acetylcholine receptor sites, there are different types of adrenaline receptor sites, and there are different types of histamine receptor sites. Histamine activates them both. Uh, what does activation of the H1 histamine receptor sites do? This causes the classic allergic response, the classic inflammatory response. It includes that histamine dilates blood vessels, histamine increases capillary permeability, uh, leading to uh, swelling or localized edema. Histamine uh, causes constriction of airways, bronchoconstriction. Uh, histamine uh, activates nerve fibers causing itching and pain. All of these are classic, classically occur during an allergic reaction when you release histamine. And as I mentioned previously, if you're a person who doesn't suffer from allergies, there is something that all of us are allergic to, and that's poison ivy. If you come in contact with poison ivy, it will trigger the release of histamine wherever you came in contact. And the vessels in that area will dilate, it'll get all red, it'll start to get uh, uh, fluid in that area, it'll get all kind of bumpy, and that's called hives, uh, swelling. It'll start to itch, uh, and, uh, and so on. This is classic histamine response in an allergic reaction. But there's also histamine type 2 receptors in our stomach. And histamine can activate these histamine 2 receptors causing increased gastric secretion. In other words, it, histamine also increases the release of hydrochloric acid, uh, a, a gastric juice from the stomach. Now, why that's important, we'll see. Anyhow, on page F2, so the first thing we want to talk about on F2 is since we now know that there are H1 histamine type 1 receptor sites that are associated with allergic reactions and histamine type 2 receptor sites associated with gastric secretion, they have developed drugs that block the H1 receptor sites and therefore reduce the allergic reaction. And as we will see, they also have H2 histamine blockers that reduce gastric secretion of hydrochloric acid. Now, our prototype, a prototype is a drug that is just a classic, that is considered a prototypical example of this category of drug, is diphenhydramine, which goes under a number of brand names, most famously Benadryl, and probably you've all heard of Benadryl. 
So uh, Benadryl uh, uh, is, um, blocks the, uh, and other uh, H1 antihistamines block H1 receptors. They also block acetylcholine receptor sites in the central nervous system, in the brain. It's just a, a side effect that not only do they block the H1 uh, histamine receptor sites, they also block the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites in the brain. And uh, uh, a drug that we have mentioned that uh, is a classic uh, uh, drug that blocks muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites is atropine. And while I've said that you don't need to know names of drugs, there's two drugs that you really should know, atropine and epinephrine. Epinephrine is the classic sympathomimetic drug. Anytime we're dealing with a sympathomimetic or adrenergic drug, it's compared to epinephrine. And atropine is the classic parasympatholytic or muscarinic cholinergic blocker. It is the classic muscarinic cholinergic blocker. Anytime we're talking about a drug, that blocks muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites, it's compared to atropine. So it's a muscarinic cholinergic blocker. And antihistamines have a little bit of this atropine-like action. They similarly block muscarinic cholinergic receptors, as, uh, primarily in the central nervous system. Why is that relevant? We'll see in a moment. So why is Benadryl given? It is used to uh, reduce allergic and inflammatory reactions. It's used to treat allergic rhinitis. You'd say, what's allergic rhinitis? That's when your nose is dripping and running and congested because of an allergy. An allergy. If we just say rhinitis, it's a cold from a virus. But if we say allergic rhinitis, uh, it's a, a congested from a you know, hay fever and an allergic reaction. It's used to control urticaria, or hives, and it is used to control burning tongue syndrome and geographic tongue, which uh, are actually pathologies related to increased release of histamine uh, in the tongue area, causing uh, inflammation of the tongue. Now, uh, the, uh, it, these drugs, these antihistamines, uh, like Benadryl, are also used to control motion sickness. Now, why are they used to control motion sickness? Because we said they also block acetylcholine receptor sites in the brain. And by blocking the acetyl action of acetylcholine uh, uh, in the brain, it tends to make you sleepy, drowsy, and... Uh, incidentally, this is why antihistamines cause sedation. They cause drowsiness. They block the effect of acetylcholine neurotransmitter in the brain. Acetylcholine's action in the brain is excitatory, and by blocking the action of acetylcholine in the brain, it causes drowsiness, CNS depression, and it also depresses the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, vestibular reflex center in the brain that uh, causes you to get uh, not, uh, and the vomiting, uh, the uh, with the vestibular reflex center that creates motion sickness. It slows down or depresses uh, that center in the brain, the vestibular reflex center. So it's used, it's beneficial in alleviating vertigo. What's vertigo? Like a spinning sensation, right? When you have this sensation that you're spinning, uh, kind of don't have good balance for a moment, uh, and nausea. Uh, and uh, all these effects are due to the anticholinergic action, the fact that it blocks the effects of acetylcholine in the central nervous system. It's also used as a sedative. What are sedatives? They help you sleep. All right, it causes sedation. And in fact, the uh, common uh, over-the-counter sleep preparations like Nitol, Compose, Sleepy, Sleepinol, Somonex, they're all available over the counter. What are they? They're an, an, an antihistamine. So you don't have to, if you want something to help you sleep, frankly, if I want something to help me sleep, I drink alcohol, but that's me. But if you want something to help you sleep and you want to take a pill, you don't have to go and get some Snitol or uh, the Somonex to help you sleep. You can just take any antihistamine. 
because uh, the uh, common antihistamines will make you sleepy. Because uh, that's all that we're doing. That's all these are, is antihistamine. It's also used as a cough suppressant. You'd say, well, <coughs> why is it going to suppress coughing? Because by blocking the excitatory action of acetylcholine on the brain, it causes sedation, CNS depression, it slows down the, uh, the vomiting reflex center, it slows down the <coughs> coughing reflex center, it slows down the motion or vestibular reflex center. So it's causing CNS depression, and uh, it's used for all these purposes. Uh, now, uh, the most common use of antihistamines like Benadryl is for allergic reactions, for colds, for runny nose, uh, and so on. So, uh, therefore, the, uh, the major side effects that uh, are created when you take it for a cold and a runny nose and, and an allergic reaction is the fact that it causes sedation. It causes you to feel sleepy. Now, again, sometimes we're giving it exactly for the reason to help you sleep. Uh, also on page F3, it does cause xerostomia. And in fact, we had learned when we spoke of atropine as a parasympatholytic drug. Think about what a parasympatholytic drug is. And incidentally, if you start to think, my God, I get so confused, you know, if it, it's a parasympathomimetic, a parasympatholytic, it's a, everybody gets confused. All right, and we're not making a big deal out of this. But uh, a, a parasympathomimetic will cause salivation, rest and digest. A parasympatholytic, a muscarinicholinergic blocker, blocks salivation. So this is a drug. Uh, antihistamines also tend to block muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites like atropine and other parasympatholytics. Uh, all right. Uh, the, uh, again, I'm not going to deal with uh, pharmacokinetics and uh, all these other facets. Uh, Benadryl is available uh, uh, as a, a topical spray. It's available as a pill. There are a whole bunch of other products that are also diphenhydramine. Benadryl is just the most famous, but you can find your favorite uh, brand there. Uh, there is something called Caladryl. Now, uh, what is Caladryl? Caladryl is available for allergic reactions, itching, and it's a combination of diphenhydramine. What's that? That's Benadryl. That's a diphenhydramine. Uh, and antihistamine and calamine lotion. Have you ever heard of calamine lotion? Yeah. All right. So when they combine that, that's called Caladryl. Calo for calamine lotion and drill for Benadryl. So when people have itching and on their skin, and this happens not only for uh, allergic reactions, but chicken pox, right, where you get all that itching, so you put uh, Caladryl on it. There are a whole bunch of other uh, H1 antihistamines that are, work just like Benadryl, just like uh, diphenhydramine. And uh, I'm sure some of you run into chlorpheniramine, which is uh, found in chlortrimeton. Uh, 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 you may have heard of dimetane, which is another antihistamine. Uh, Actifed has tripolidine. These are just all H1 antihistamines. They work just like Benadryl. They're all the same. So again, we might ask, why are there so many drugs that are basically work like Benadryl? Because a lot of people buy them, right? They're, uh, they're available not only as prescription, but over the counter. And lots of different uh, pharmaceutical drug companies want to have their products out because there's a lot of money made. So there's lots of more than just one brand, uh, more than just one manufacturer of antihistamines. On uh, page F4, uh, I, I'll just mention a couple of other uh, antihistamines, H, again, just like Benadryl, just like Benadryl. You may have heard of Phenergan. Has anybody ever heard of Phenergan? So Phenergan uh, is another antihistamine. It's actually promethazine, and uh, it uh, blocks a histamine as well as some other uh, receptor sites. And uh, it's used as an antihistamine and an antiemetic. What's antiemetic mean? What's a mesis? A 
Emesis means to vomit. So antiemetic means it stops vomiting, it stops nausea. And so it's used to reduce nausea, it's used to reduce motion sickness, as are all the other antihistamines, including Benadryl, we just said. It, it causes CNS depression, and it can be used as a cough suppressant, as a vomiting suppressant, as a motion suppressant. So it's used for all those actions on the brain. Obviously, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, doesn't it? And uh, Dramamine. What's Dramamine? You've all heard of Dramamine. You've taken Dramamine for motion sickness. What is it? An antihistamine. So if you don't have Dramamine, take any antihistamine. They all do the same thing. Uh, another one is, uh, another one you may have heard of is Merazine. Same thing. Motion sickness. Uh, Meclizine goes under brand name, not only Dramamine, but Antivert. I kind of like that brand name, Antivert. You know what that implies? Anti-vertigo. The brand names are always very clever. They try to think of clever ways for prescribers to remember it. It's a lot easier to remember antivert than meclizine. Um, and uh, another one you may have heard of is uh, Vistaril or Atarax. Let me put uh, this in a context where I personally run into this. Uh, our uh, first daughter, uh, when she was uh, six months old, developed uh, herpetic angina in her mouth. Anybody know what herpetic angina is? Yeah. So that's a herpes virus in the mouth, and so she was like six months old, uh, and uh, she had all these herpetic lesions in her mouth, uh, and obviously it causes a lot of pain. You know, we've all had a cold sore, Right? And it causes a lot of pain. So imagine a whole, inside the mouth, a whole bunch of herpetic lesions. So uh, it's, uh, it was, uh, as you know, herpes is viral. So you can't give an antibiotic. That's not going to knock out the virus. So she wouldn't, uh, she couldn't drink, uh, a, a drink any milk and so on. It hurt too much. She was uh, up the whole night, wasn't going to sleep. And uh, the uh, pediatrician prescribed Fenrigan. And uh, why Fenergan? Uh, because it's an antihistamine, and uh, so it had two benefits. The antihistamine reduced the redness and swelling of the herpetic lesions. It doesn't get rid of the virus, but at least it reduced the redness and swelling and pain. And it has the side effect of making you sleep. So at least the baby, the infant, was able to sleep. Uh, and then uh, after a few days, the herpetic lesions subsided. So uh, anyhow, that's uh, Fenergan. Now, uh, they have a, a newer generation of uh, antihistamines, uh, and we've mentioned them before. Obviously, these antihistamines cross the blood-brain barrier and cause drowsiness and uh, CNS depression. But most of the time, when you take an antihistamine, most of the time you're not taking it as a cough suppressant, you're not taking it to help you sleep. You're taking it for your runny nose, your drippy, you know, all that. You're, uh, and so, in order to reduce the CNS depression, to reduce the sedation, we had mentioned that they made the drugs less fat soluble. So they were less able to cross the blood brain barrier. These uh, I've referred to as second generation uh, H1 antihistamines. Now, the most, I think, widely prescribed one at this time of these is Zyrtec. Anybody run into Zyrtec? All right, but there's a whole bunch of these. We've mentioned them before. Allegra, Claritin, Clarinex. These are all antihistamines. They generally require a prescription, but the main point, as we mentioned, is they don't cross the blood-brain barrier, at least as rapidly as the more or the older, more classical antihistamines, and therefore they do not produce those anticholinergic effects, those actions of blocking acetylcholine receptor sites leading to sedation, drowsiness, CNS depression, and so on. So uh, that's what people commonly take as antihistamines when they don't want to cause so much drowsiness, these second generation antihistamines. Now, uh, this, this uh, may be kind of interesting to know a little bit about. There are a whole bunch, when you go to the drugstore, they have all these cold preparations. And I can only imagine what the average layperson, when they go to that aisle,
and there are so many different coal preparations, and you wonder, what the hell is the difference between any of these? Let me tell you, there's really almost no difference between any of them. All right? Almost all of these uh, over-the-counter OTC coal preparations usually contain two or three ingredients. They usually contain two or three ingredients, and they're all basically the same. And the example I'd like to use of this is let's look at actually an F5, on F5. So let's use as an example on page F5 one of the most commonly taken coal products, co-Tylenol. You ever taken co-Tylenol? Ever heard of it? So it's got three things in co-Tylenol, three ingredients. It's got chlorpheniramine. What's that? An antihistamine. Incidentally, all the antihistamines end in E. Diphenhydramine. Chlorpheniramine. So it's got an antihistamine that reduces the release and blocks the action of histamine in causing uh, the drowning, the dripping, and the swelling, and the, all that. It's got acetaminophen. That makes sense. It's a Tylenol. So it's got acetaminophen or Tylenol. And of course, we haven't spoken of it yet, but we know that acetaminophen uh, or Tylenol is a, a pain reliever. It's a non-narcotic analgesic. An analgesic. Analgesics are pain relievers. And the third ingredient is pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine. Now we've mentioned pseudoephedrine. And our first thought is, yeah, I'm all mixed up. I can't remember all. You got too many drugs. Pseudoephedrine is like ephedrine. Does that help you? Ephedrine is like a, a, like a epinephrine that works orally. And we had said that pseudoephedrine or pseudoephed is a weaker version of ephedrine. So it works like epinephrine. So you'd say, well, okay, why do I want to take something like epinephrine? It's used as a decongestant, decongestant bronchodilator. And we might say, okay, why would something that works like epinephrine, works like epinephrine, be used as a decongestant bronchodilator? Because pseudoephedrine, which works like epinephrine, is sympathomimetic causes most blood vessels to constrict. Epinephrine causes most blood vessels to constrict, and that includes constricting of the vessels in your nose to reduce swelling and dripping, decongestant. And epinephrine and other sympathomimetics have what effect on airways? They dilate airways. So it brought a bronchodilator. So this is the classic kind of approach that in all, in all of these over-the-counter cold medications, now, uh, they are providing relief of the symptoms from cold. Because when you've got this cold, which is a virus, a viral infection, or it's an allergic reaction, might be taking it for an allergy. So, uh, it's blocking the action of histamine, uh, having a pain reliever, and uh, helping to reduce the droopy, dirty nose, and uh, dilating your airways, provides symptomatic relief uh, for uh, the symptoms of cold. But let's be clear on this. Are any of these ingredients antiviral? No. So even though you're taking it for that cold, remember, a cold is caused by a virus. And so it may make you feel better, but it hasn't done anything against the real underlying cause of the cold, which is a virus. So it provides symptomatic relief. It makes you feel better, but it doesn't do anything against the virus. Yep. They all work the same. They're all the same. Uh, let's take a look at a few others. Uh, if, uh, if we go back to page F4, so uh, Actifed, if you've heard of Actifed, it's just got two ingredients. It's got tripolidine, and uh, that's an antihistamine. They're all the same. Uh, and it's got pseudoephedrine, which we said is a decongestant bronchodilator. Alright, 
And what about Alarest? Oh, they still market Alarest. Okay. Alarest is an chlorpheniramine, an antihistamine, and phenylpropanolamine. Uh, they've reformulated it, but that's another sympathomimetic, like pseudoephedrine. Uh, there, there are a whole bunch of others. I, I, our goal here is not to go through all of them. Anybody ever hear a triaminic? All right, so what's triaminic? Uh, triaminic, this is on the bottom of F5. So triaminic is pyr uh, pyrilamine maleate, ene, it's an antihistamine. And the phenylpropanolamine, which I think they've reformulated now to, uh, 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 to uh, phenylephrine, but uh, it's basically just a decongestant bronchodilator. And all these decongestant bronchodilators work like epinephrine. They are sympathomimetics. Sympathomimetics. So they're all the same. You can look at all the packages. You will see almost all of these cold medications have two or three ingredients. It's almost always a decongested bronchodilator and an antihistamine, and some of them also add uh, a pain reliever, either acetaminophen or ibuprofen as a non-narcotic pain reliever or analgesic. <clears throat> all right, uh, on, uh, on the next page, uh, which is uh, F6, not labeled, I just want to remind you, we've uh, spoken of this before. This is F6. This is, what this is showing on F6 is a mast cell. Mast cells Mast cells uh, release histamine and other chemical mediators of inflammation. What causes the mast cell to release these chemicals? So I'm just reminding you that what attaches to the surface of the mast cell are IgE antibodies. And IgE antibodies are the antibodies produced against allergens. Remember this? And so when an allergen, an antigen, attaches to the IgE antibodies on the surface of the mast cell, that triggers the release of histamine and other chemical mediators of inflammation that uh, cause uh, blood vessels to dilate, causes vasodilation, it causes activation of <coughs> mucus secretion, uh, it causes uh, Activation of nerve endings causing itching and pain. It also, uh, up here, it can activate visceral smooth muscle cells to contract, and that's what leads to bronchoconstriction. So, this is the actions of histamine in causing things like bronchoconstriction, vasodilation, itching, and so on. Now, we had mentioned that there's a second type of histamine receptor sites. The second type, histamine type 2 receptors, are located where? There in the stomach, in the wall of the stomach. Activation, when histamine activates the H2 receptors in the stomach, it increases gastric secretion. So activation, uh, the H2 receptors in the stomach leads to increased release of hydrochloric acid, HCl. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, on page uh, G1, on G1, I'm going to come back to that point momentarily. On G1, I'll cover this very briefly, gastrointestinal drugs. I'm not going to say too much here. Uh, I'm, uh, the main one I want to speak of is GERD. Anybody know what GERD stands for? Good, wonderful. Gastroesophageal reflux disease or disorder. 
And uh, we know that uh, what's happening here in GERD is there's acid reflux uh, from the stomach up into the esophagus. And this, uh, this uh, can not only damage the inner wall of the esophagus, but this increased uh, in, uh, reflux of acid can even increase acidity in the mouth, the oral cavity, leading to uh, effects on the teeth and the uh, mucosa of the mouth. Now, one of the things that people do for this acid reflux is they can take antacids. Uh, antacids will reduce the acidity. Basically, what uh, is in an antacid is a buffer. Uh, but on page G2, so I've mentioned some of the uh, common antacids that are taken. And these can include sodium bicarbonate, magnesium hydroxide, and aluminum hydroxide. I'm not asking you to know these. That's what Maalox is, if you've heard of Maalox. Tums is calcium carbonate. Uh, Rolates is calcium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide. Uh, probably everybody has heard of Maalox, Tums, Rolates. All of these uh, are antacids. They are buffers that reduce acidity. But here's really what I wanted to speak of. H2 blockers. And you say, what's that? So we had said that, there were, that histamine activates the secretion of acid, gastric secretion. So they have developed drugs that block the histamine 2 receptors in the stomach and thereby decrease gastric secretion. This is exactly what we wrote here for pharmacodynamics. So, this includes the very famous H2 blocker, or a drug used to control acid reflux, pepsin. And the pep comes from like a peptic, refers to the stomach. And it also includes axid and Zantac and Tagamet, and uh, there's a, really a whole bunch of these uh, that uh, all reduce uh, acid production. And uh, let's take a look at page G3. And on G3, on the bottom of G3, is a little diagram, and our first thought is, what is it? Uh, it's showing a cell in the stomach. This is a stomach cell called a parietal cell. And what's, what, this is a stomach, in the, uh, a stomach in the cell. No, it's not a stomach in the cell. It's a cell in the stomach. So this is the stomach. And this parietal cell secretes hydrogen ion. Right? This is called hydrochloric acid. It secretes hydrogen ion into the lumen or cavity of the stomach. So it secretes hy uh, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen ion. And uh, the, uh, the mechanism by which this cell is secreting the hydrogen ion into the cavity of the stomach uh, it involves a pump, an tra active transport pump. And they call this active transport pump that secretes hydrochloric acid or hydrogen ions, they call it a proton pump. And our first thought is, yeah, why do they call it a proton pump? So I mentioned this once before. Remember that a hydrogen ion is really a proton. And if you're thinking, why is that? You'll remember that a, a hydrogen atom a hydrogen atom has one proton in the nucleus and one electron orbiting around it. That's a hydrogen atom. All right, so it's got one proton in the nucleus with one electron orbiting. Now, what's a hydrogen ion? An ion is an atom that, a hydrogen atom that gave away its electron. So a hydrogen ion is just a proton. It has no electron, it gave it away. So all I'm simply explaining here is why this is called a proton pump. It's secreting hydrogen ions or protons. 
Now, you'll notice that what? There are three things that cause this cell in the stomach to secrete hydrogen ion. A hormone called gastrin, if you've ever heard of that. Histamine can cause this proton pump to secrete hydrogen ion, hydrochloric acid, and acetylcholine. Those are muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites. And in case you're trying to think, yeah, what's that about? A parasympathomimetic is, a, a, a parasympathetic state is the rest and digest state, which includes increased gastric secretion. So uh, acetylcholine also activates this uh, secretion of hydrochloric acid. Anyhow, here's the point. Uh, we, they have drugs that block the uh, H2, the histamine, the histamine 2 receptor sites. These are called H2 blockers. What's an example? Pepsid, Zantac, Axid. So uh, they are blocking the H2 receptors. That's how they work. Now, they have uh, other drugs that interfere with uh, uh, this proton pump uh, directly. So if we now go back to G2, back on G2, they have a newer category of drugs that are called proton pump inhibitors. And they directly inhibit the active transport of hydrogen ions into the stomach. <clears throat> And these go by the brand names on G3. They go by the brand names, and I'm sure you've heard of them. They go by the brand name Provacid, Nexium, and my favorite brand name, Protonix. Why is that my favorite brand name? Sounds like it might affect the proton pump, since it's called Protonix. So has anybody ever heard of Provacid or Nexium? All right, all of these drugs are used to control acid reflux, too much acid. And, if, and if, again, when you go to the drugstore, not only is there an entire aisle of over-the-counter cold medications, which we've now tried to explain what they have inside them, they're all the same, they all have antihistamines, a decongestant bronchodilator, and maybe a pain reliever, but there's a whole aisle of all these products for acid reflux. And so they've got the uh, Pepsid, and they've got the uh, 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 Maalox, which is a, a buffer, uh, and uh, Tums, and Rolades, and they've got Nexium, and Provacid, and some of the Prilosec, and so on, which directly block the proton uh, pump, or the secretion of hydrogen ion. So again, I don't think any of these are that important, but they're very common. And uh, you might ask, well, what, are, are there really that many people who suffer from acid reflux? And the answer is yes. And it becomes more common as you get older. And uh, the most important factor that tends to trigger or bring on acid reflux is eating too late at night, close to when you go to sleep. Because if you go to sleep with a full tummy, so uh, they, they, all that gastric juice in the stomach starts to flow backwards up your esophagus, and that's called acid reflux. So uh, th that's the main thing. A lot of people like to go, you know, let's say Saturday night, let's get a pizza, 11 at night, <laughs> right? 11.30, 12 midnight, let's have a pizza. Everything on it, onions, bell peppers, anchovies, everything. And then, uh, you know, by 1 o'clock, let's go to sleep. And you go to sleep, and you've got all this uh, stuff in your stomach, and it starts to reflux back up. So then they go, oh my gosh, where's the Pepsid? Where's the Nexium? Where's the uh, Provacid, all right? And that's just very, very common. Uh, all right, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna deal with the treatment of uh, constipation. Let's, uh, okay, uh, now uh, we're gonna take a break. When we come back from the break, uh, we're finally gonna talk about some drugs that I think you're actually gonna find interesting, uh, finally. Uh, up till now, I think the drugs we've been talking about are important, but not necessarily interesting. But we're going to get into drugs that are used to deal with emotional problems. <laughs>